I think, looks like, yes, President Becky, I think you're here. Eileen, <laughs> you're there. David? There's Howard. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Don't look. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Litvak, uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center's Director for Programs. I'd like to welcome you to today's meeting, a, a special uh, meeting jointly sponsored with the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, today's session is uh, another in our ongoing Directors Forum, and uh, the President and Director of the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, former Congressman Lee Hamilton, uh, is very sorry that he's unable to attend today. I see my former colleague, Howard Volpe, the founding the founding director of, the, of this Wilson Center's Africa program among our, our distinguished visitors today. Uh, the delegation was uh, uh, delayed uh, due to a meeting at the White House to discuss the issues that we will continue discussing here today. I simply wanted to welcome all of you to today's uh, session. Uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center is the uh, nation's uh, official memorial to our 28th president established by an act of Congress to serve as a bridge between the worlds of learning and public policy and to uh, provide uh, a forum for the types of uh, sessions uh, of which this is an excellent example of pressing public policy issues. Uh, in keeping with the center's overall mission, uh, our Africa program under the excellent direction of Steve McDonald serves as an, uh, a forum for informed debate about the multiple challenges and opportunities facing Africa and about American interests and policy toward the continent, and it's a wide-ranging set of activities that the Africa program uh, oversees, including a working group on, on Sudan, which uh, today's meeting builds on. We're particularly pleased to be partnering with the United States Institute of Peace, and it's a great pleasure and honor to be rec uh, welcoming our two distinguished uh, uh, speakers today, uh, former President Thabo Mbeki and uh, Haile uh, Minkarios, uh, the Special Representative of the, United, uh, of the Secretary General in Sudan. So with that, let me turn the floor over to the uh, uh, Director of the Africa Program, Steve McDonald, who will uh, introduce our moderator and speaker. So Steve, over to you. Thank you very much, Rob. I appreciate your, uh, your help. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, sorry to have kept you waiting, but uh, it was beyond our control. President Obama just insisted on seeing these guys. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I want to, uh, of course, officially welcome all of our honored guests, uh, President Mbeki. Uh, we have President Buyoya, uh, President uh, Abubakar, uh, and a number of other very distinguished guests uh, who I'll recognize in just a moment. But uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Uh, I think this is going to be a very useful session today. Uh, uh, we will introduce our, our panel speakers in a moment, uh, although we won't do much uh, uh, in the way of bios because you have that before you, and these are gentlemen who are well known to you. But I do want to uh, uh, to uh, say uh, thank you to the U.S. Institute of Peace. Rob mentioned that. They're co-sponsoring with this. Uh, they share our, uh, our dedication to peace building in Africa, and they're represented here today by David Smock, the Vice President of the uh, Center for Mediation and Conflict Resolution, who will be our moderator today. Uh, also, a special thanks uh, to uh, Special Envoy Gratian, uh, uh, General Gratian, and your staff uh, at State Department who have worked so closely with us on coordinating this event. We appreciate that very much. Uh, I'm particularly happy to welcome uh, uh, President Mbeki to this forum. Uh, I've worked with him long ago in the days of, of apartheid when we were trying to gather and better inform members of Congress on issues there. Um, uh, my colleague Howard Wolpe was very much involved in that effort. Um, uh, but also uh, we have uh, um, since been very involved in uh, conflict transformation work in Burundi, DRC, and Liberia uh, in, uh, on the continent. And President Mbeki as president uh, and, and South Africa as a facilitation nation in those, the two conflicts in uh, the DRC and Burundi have been very, very cooperative and helpful in the work we've done there, and I appreciate that. Also, Haile Menkirios, our second speaker, uh, is an old friend and uh, confident of the work we have been doing, a good friend of Howard Wolpe's as well, and he's been uh, a guiding hand for us for many years in the, uh, for, in the peace building and recovery work that we've been trying to do in Africa. Um, likewise, one of our other guests in the audience, a special uh, welcome to President Bioya. 
uh, who was also very facilitative in uh, working with us in Burundi when we began our work in 2002. Um, uh, he helped us to launch our program there. Uh, uh, where we were working to restore trust, communications, and collaborative capacity amongst the top leadership of that divided country. And I think that's been a remarkable success story for the most part. Going through a patchy time now with the elections there, so we'll see. Um, I also just want to recognize uh, for everyone here some of our other uh, distinguished guests. Uh, welcome again, uh, uh, General uh, uh, Abdullah Sal Salami Abubakar, uh, who was uh, President of Nigeria. Also want to recognize our AU Ambassador, uh, Amina Ali, who's supposed to be here. Is she? Uh, the, okay, there you are. <laughs> Sorry, I mean. Um, uh, <coughs> Ambassador uh, Akek Kok uh, from the Embassy of Sudan. Welcome, Ambassador. Uh, also, uh, uh, um, uh, Ezekiel Lowell Gatuk, the head of the uh, s mission for the South Sudanese government. Uh, General Scott Gratian, the special envoy for Sudan, who I've already mentioned. Uh, Mr. Uh, Pagan Amun Okech, who's the SPLM Secretary General. I, do, I don't know, but uh, there you are, sir. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. Uh, a special shout out to my colleague, Howard Wolpe, who uh, helped us launch this program, and he's now over at the State Department, uh, but he's an honored guest always when he comes into the Woodrow Wilson Center, so welcome, Howard. Uh, then I finally want to recognize uh, one person who's here and one person who is not. We do have this very, very uh, useful working group on Sudan, and it's chaired by Alan Golty, who is here, former British ambassador to Sudan, and uh, by Neraldine Sati, uh, former SRSG in Burundi and a good friend of this program's, but also working very hard on issues in Sudan, and he is uh, there right now uh, in Juba and can't be with us, but hopefully is watching on our internet broadcast. Um, as for our subject today, uh, this is indeed a critical moment in the Sudan. The April 6th to 16th to 10th elections for president have been widely and correctly, I think, criticized for not being free and fair. The SPLM choice to withdraw its candidate was problematic, and the internal community uh, fears that both North and South, uh, NCP and SPLM, are setting the stage for the referendum to come in January 2011. Uh, that referendum, of course, will allow the South to choose either unity, with the North, or secession. The questions that arise are troublesome. Uh, will, will both governments and the internal community work to assure a free and fair referendum process and a full understanding by the Southern population of their options? Will both North and South accept the outcome of the referendum, whatever it is? Is the international community, in particular the African Union, United States, um, United Nations, but also other key players like the EU, Great Britain, China, working in close cooperation to engage leaders from North and South and ensure a referendum process that is, process that is peaceful and reflective of the political will of the people, and to look beyond the referendum to assist in the peaceful transition to whatever new dispensation emerges. It is this critical moment that we have gathered here to hear from our two key high-level stakeholders in this unfolding scene former South Africa President Thabo Mbeki um, and uh, SRSG Heidi Mercurios. President Mbeki, as you know, is the head of the uh, Africa Union High-Level Implementation Plan for Sudan. And Haile is the uh, special representative of the Secretary General for Sudan and the head of the UN mission there. Uh, you have their full bios, so I won't say any more. I'm going to ask them in turn to offer us some reflections on the current post-election and pre-referendum situation. David Spock, my colleague who I've already mentioned from USIP, has kindly agreed to moderate. And uh, uh, we will, after uh, remarks by our two principals, open up for questions and answers and some comments and hopefully reply to some of your concerns. For those in the overflow flow rooms to who I'm speaking, there will be a room manager who at the proper time will pass out cards and you can submit your questions through him and her as well. So with little else, we will turn it over to President Becky. Thank you, sir. No, Steve, how long should we speak? <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, but I've just asked him how long am I supposed to speak, uh, bearing in mind the size of Sudan. It's a very big country. <laughs> <coughs> and he said, uh, 10 minutes. Then I compromised. 
You compromised a bit, yes. Let's see what happens. Uh, 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 indeed, as, uh, we are very glad indeed that we've had this uh, opportunity with the Wilson Center and the uh, Institute for Peace uh, to uh, enable us to come today to, uh, to share some, some, some of our views about the situation in Sudan, which, which indeed is very important, important for all of us. Uh, as far as I can recall, uh, the, the African Union has never set up a panel such as our panel to deal with a particular issue on the African continent. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean we're important people. I'm just saying <laughs> that uh, I, I cannot recall a panel of this kind. And the reason really for that uh, is because of the recognition of the importance of Sudan uh, for the rest of our continent. Uh, all of us here are very, I'm quite certain, familiar with, uh, with, this, with this setting. Uh, that here we have a Sudan, a very big country, shares borders with nine other African countries. Uh, and therefore, uh, its future, the future of Sudan, becomes immediately uh, important to that neighborhood. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, to the continent as a whole. And so it becomes very important that whatever happens uh, in Sudan, we should bear in mind that whatever happens in Sudan uh, is of immediate relevance to the continent as a whole. Um, hence, this particular intervention by the African Union in setting up this uh, panel of implementation panel on Sudan, uh, <clears throat> so that we can see on behalf of the continent what input we could make uh, to assist the Sudanese people to resolve their problems. And really, there are these, there are three main challenges. Uh, I would, I have to try and stick to this time frame, so I'll be very brief. There's the challenge of the resolution of the conflict in Darfur. Uh, now, there is a, fortunately an agreed position, an internationally agreed position now, uh, uh, that the peace agreement, the Darfur peace agreement, needs to be concluded. Uh, before the referendum, uh, South Sudan referendum, uh, in January 2011. So we've got between now and the end of the year to find a solution to this conflict in Darfur. Um, <clears throat> for which reason we are uh, we have agreed uh, that there should be con we, we agreed with the Darfurians uh, they should be convened. Uh, uh, a negotiating process which is inclusive of all of the Darfurians. Uh, an inclusive process which would then deal with all matters uh, that are on the agenda of that negotiation, which would relate to power sharing, which relate to wealth sharing, which relate to defining the place of Darfur with regard to the rest of Sudan, uh, all of these matters. <clears throat> and I must say that in this regard, the population in, the, in Darfur indeed uh, agrees that there should be such a, a, an inclusive a negotiating process uh, so that uh, uh, together, uh, as, as the Darfurians, uh, they define uh, the future uh, of Darfur. So we'll begin immediately to work on the convening of that, uh, of that inclusive process, which would include the armed formations <clears throat> to include the armed formations in, in, in Darfur, uh, so that, as I say, everybody is there. One of the matters which uh, I'm sure that people are interested in here, which will serve on that agenda, uh, is the issue of justice and reconciliation. When we uh, uh, interacted with the uh, population of Darfur last year quite extensively, we spent 40 days plus in Darfur uh, talking to the Darfurians to get a sense from them of their understanding of the nature of the conflict and their own view as to how the conflict might be resolved. One of the issues that arose was that indeed crimes had been committed in Darfur, that uh, this needed to be investigated and needed to be prosecuted and adjudicated. And the, a particular problem that was raised was that uh, that population in Darfur didn't have sufficient confidence in the independence of the Sudanese judiciary and therefore felt that uh, you, you couldn't rely on that judiciary to, to try and, uh, the, the, and adjudicate these particular cases which, call, which relate to crimes committed in Darfur. 
And indeed, then we uh, some of the legal circles in Sudan propose that perhaps to to address that matter, we should then uh, uh, have a hybrid court of the kind that was established in Sierra Leone, uh, which would include uh, local Sudanese judges who would be in, reinforced uh, by judges, prosecutors, investigators that would be appointed by the African Union who would come to reinforce that the Sudanese counterparts. Uh, so this is one of the matters that, that will be served on that agenda. And indeed, we went back to the Tafurian population before making that recommendation to say, look, this is what we're going to recommend. What do you say? And they said, we agree. <clears throat> so uh, we've now agreed to the government of Sudan that uh, uh, they'll delegate uh, a group of people to work with us on the detail of this matter uh, so that when the this Darfur, Darfur conference is inclusive conference to negotiate a resolution of this uh, conflict in Darfur. Uh, that, that, that by that time, this matter should have been decided uh, between ourselves and the, between the panel and the government as to how to handle that issue of justice and reconciliation. <clears throat> That's an important intervention then with regard to, to Darfur. I just want, because of the shortage of time, just to deal with that particular issue. Uh, so that by uh, indeed before before we get to the referendum, uh, this Darfur matter ought to be resolved, and we we want to make sure that that happens. Then, secondly, of course, there is the issue of the implementation of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, and I think that uh, <clears throat> the the sense that we get, or the message that we get uh, from the principal political parties. Uh, the principal political forces in, in Sudan, and that includes, that means the SPLM and the, and the, and the NCP, is indeed that uh, everybody needs to keep to the agreement. The referendum must take place in January, uh, as, as, as agreed, uh, and that the outcome of that referendum needs to be respected. Uh, so what then remains uh, is that all of the necessary preparations should be done uh, uh, to ensure that you have a credible, credible process uh, in terms of that referendum so that the outcome is not questioned by anybody. There shouldn't be a possibility of somebody saying that, no, no, there was fraud or something, uh, because as I was saying a critical matter in regard to this is the acceptance of whatever the people of South Sudan will decide uh, in, in this regard. So perhaps uh, the uh, special representative of the Secretary General, uh, Haile Menkerios, might, might discuss uh, some of what needs to be done in order to support uh, that process to ensure that we do indeed have that credible referendum in January, uh, as I say, whose outcome then needs to be uh, respected. <clears throat> there will be there are outstanding matters that still need to be sorted out uh, prior to, to that referendum which include the finalization of the discussions about the north-south border, uh, issues uh, that relate to finalization of issues that relate to RBA, borders of RBA, identification of voters, and so on, issues that relate to the popular consultation that must take place uh, involving uh, these two states, Blue Nile and, and South Kordofan. Uh, <clears throat> So these are outstanding matters, but these are matters that, uh, as a panel, both in, in, indeed UNMIS, we, we are trying to attend to working together with, with the principal parties uh, in Sudan uh, so that you got to clear these matters uh, to create this, this possibility to, to arrive at the, at the referendum as planned. And, of course, one of the, the matters that's been agreed, uh, again, by the SPLM and the, the, the parties to the CPA, is a negotiation of the post-referendum arrangements um, and the various items on that agenda have been identified, what we do about oil, what we do about citizenship, what we have to do about a whole variety of matters. You now those discussions, uh, I think the first meeting is now scheduled for the 21st of June. Um, that would begin this process of the engagement between the uh, uh, NCP and the SPLM on the post-referendum matters, uh, so that uh, <clears throat> people are clear, if the, if the population votes for unity, what happens? Uh, if the population votes for separation, what happens? So that, that, that discussion will, will, will take place. So uh, we... Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
the elections have uh, produced uh, whatever the weaknesses in those elections have produced this, this particular result, that they have in fact strengthened uh, both the SPLM and the NCP, the two signatories to the CPA. Uh, <clears throat> so it's, it's given them the, the authority uh, indeed to do what they have to do in the context of what was agreed, which is complaint contained in the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. Uh, and uh, indeed, so we are then saying to both of them that with the sort of mandate that they have, they've then got this shared responsibility to work closely together in these next few months, indeed to ensure that the CPA is then implemented as was agreed. Bearing in mind the agency, therefore, of all of these things, bearing in mind that there isn't enough time uh, to do all of these things. So, <clears throat> but I'm very glad to say that uh, really our own sense uh, uh, of, of, the, of the population in Sudan and the political forces there is that I think that people have learned the necessary lessons from this very long period of war uh, uh, in South Sudan. And of course, it's also this shorter period of war in Darfur. And uh, I think it wouldn't be easy uh, for people to say, we want to return to a war situation. Uh, and therefore, the critical importance of finding solutions to all of these outstanding problems so that we avoid a, a return to a situation of war. So what really basically I'm saying is that we really do believe that the, despite the challenges, despite the shortage of time, uh, we actually, its situation is, is hopeful. The situation is hopeful, and uh, the leadership, uh, uh, the political leadership in Sudan, I think, has an understanding uh, of the responsibilities it has uh, to, to make sure that the, these matters, which have been commonly identified, are indeed addressed and achieved. The last point I'd like to make is that on the, on the 8th of, uh, of last month, May, uh, we held a meeting in, in Addis Ababa. Uh, it was convened jointly by the African Union and the United Nations to, to bring in uh, the rest of the international community because, as you know, there's enormous interest in the Sudan matter. Uh, and we thought that it would be important that there should be proper coordination uh, by that in, within that international community to address all these matters. And so, so indeed everybody came. Uh, Scott Grayson was there and uh, all of the special envoys, uh, the Arab League, uh, IGAD, uh, Organization of the Islamic Conference, all of the neighboring countries and so on, a big conference for us to come to an agreement about how do we coordinate our work with regard to, the, to, to Sudan. And fortunately everybody agreed. We all identified what the issues are, uh, where we need to go, and agreed on a mechanism, a, a mechanism which we then get together every two months so that we can then coordinate our work. So I'm quite confident that arising out of that, it will be possible for the international community to move together in step uh, with regard to addressing all of these challenges, which is an important thing. So you avoid all manner of interventions which might complicate the situation uh, so that we, we make one intervention. Uh, having consulted and coordinated among ourselves. So um, I think that uh, we are therefore dealing with a, a situation which I think is, is, is really quite hopeful uh, and, and would want to, certainly from the point of view of the African continent, then indeed make all of the necessary interventions to ensure that it, it, Sudan, Sudan, whether it's one country or two countries, uh, is a factor for peace, for stability, for progress on the continent, rather than a factor for the destabilization of the rest of the continent. So the, the, the outcomes of this process has become very important for, for the future of Africa. And I think we, we will get there with your support. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> Have ten minutes or nine? <laughs> <laughs> Twelve. He took fifteen. <laughs> okay.
Thank you very much. Um, I guess uh, um, uh, we're all aware that um, the process of um, implementation of the CPA um, is now getting to its final phase, which is the um, the um, um, implement, I mean the referendum, carrying out the referendum in um, uh, South Sudan and in Abyei, and also the popular um, consultations in um, Southern Kordofan and Blue Nile states. Now. Up to now, I think if we look at the record of the two of the two parties, the, uh, we see that they have maintained their commitment to the <coughs> CPA implementation without major breakdowns. And I think uh, to that extent, okay, so far uh, so good. We've seen um, how much other uh, uh, agreements of such nature um, have had rocky uh, processes. So I think um, in, in, in that the two have maintained their commitment um, without a major breakdown is a positive thing one can build upon. And the two parties um, continue also to express their commitment to the full implementation of, um, um, of the CPA, including the um, um, uh, commitment to carry through the last phase that we um, um, uh, we explained is the uh, carrying out the practical uh, sort of implementation of the referenda and the popular consultations. There is, however, a, you know, sort of um, a, a different aspect um, in the process of this implementation in that. So far, um, even the election, which was an important landmark in the process of implementation of the CPA, um, uh, the two may not have fully uh, cooperated, but I, they had parallel interests. In other words, you know, they were, well, this, the finality of this, um, of this referendum and the fact that the two would be aspiring for opposite outcomes mm -hmm. Um, places the two, therefore, if not in collusion, in competition. And that is why um, and, um, uh, there is much uh, concern about how this process uh, will, um, uh, will go. Um, in order to, um, um, to start the process right now, I think it was unfortunate that the election was postponed, um, postponed and postponed and postponed until April uh, this year, which ate up into the, um, the time frame for the implementation of what remains of this last phase of implementation of um, the CPA. And therefore, there's a lot of concern. Um, uh, that, uh, there is a very tight uh, frame right now um, or, all the processes that have to go, will there be enough time um, for that? And um, what needs to be done in order for this uh, last phase to be implemented uh, smoothly? Um, of course, there are those aspects uh, that are expected um, from the parties. Uh, um, um, the formation of uh, the government of national unity, which has been completed already, it has been announced. The formation of the government of uh, southern Sudan, these uh, are the instruments which would um, uh, carry much of uh, the, the processes that are necessary. Uh, uh, this also we expect uh, would be done by uh, within this week, this is what we are, um, are told. Um, the formation of the referenda commissions, as was mentioned before, the referendum commission for the South has been agreed to. It's in Parliament right now, um, uh, and we are expecting that in the next two days it would be formed. The formation of the commission on ABA, um, uh, still there are um, um, differences. And... Um, uh, it, it's more or less uh, connected with the question of eligibility. Who is eligible to vote? Who uh, is a resident of, um, 
of, of, of ABA. This question has not been uh, resolved yet by the two parties. I think when they uh, couldn't, they passed it to the referendum, the ABA referendum commission that is going to be formed. Um, I, um, uh, I, I sort of feel if the two parties at the highest level couldn't agree uh, to what extent that commission would then agree, I think it would have to be on the leaderships of these two to um, uh, find a solution so that the commission will just be reduced to just the practical implementation aspects rather than to have to decide. And simply because it's given that very difficult uh, task, uh, the question of who chairs it now has become a very critical issue. And there are four members from each side. The chair decides, uh, determines, and therefore um, um, there is a lot of uh, disagreement on that. Um, but I believe um, a solution would be, uh, will be found um, particularly as some progress in the post-referendum arrangements as better understanding on what is going to happen to the question of citizenship, to the question of the free uh, movement of migrants who have um, migrated into a the area for uh, grazing, the question of um, 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 how to uh, arrange, in other words, you know, on sharing um, on um, uh, 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 sort of mutually beneficial exploitation of resources. As understanding on this progress is being made, I think the question of um, uh, the issue of um, uh, the, referenda, the referendum in IBA also uh, would be um, made easier. And there's the demarcation of the border. Um, uh, the, the ad hoc committee has already presented its, uh, its report. Uh, uh, it has agreed on some. It has had differences uh, on some. And it has presented this to uh, the two parties. And I uh, believe here, too, it is not impossible for the two to reach um, uh, agreement on them. It might take uh, a little time. But this is an agenda item also that would have to uh, be finalized. The good thing is the committee has started demarcating those areas where there is um, there's agreement. The popular consultations um, in um, uh, Kordofan and uh, Blue Nile states, these popular consultations are, are very important. Um, I feel um, uh, the nature, uh, this is a situation where if there is proper understanding reached where um, uh, the uh, governance um, set up, where the two communities could live not in one state and two systems, which is not going to be possible, but one state and one system, then that could be an example that could point to the future of Sudan. If um, uh, not properly addressed, then uh, one uh, could expect the same conditions that led to the South-North conflict could be um, recreated uh, in those states as well. And the whole agreement might, in other words, you know, the future uh, relationship might, too, um, might um, uh, uh, find a weak spot, a cons conflictual situation around its, um, its seams. So far, it has started not uh, 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 um, uh, with full force, but it has started the, the fact that um, uh, people um, in those states are still hopeful, still uh, very much um, ready to engage. I think that is a positive thing, and we would need to uh, support and um, uh, help that process so that it doesn't become, uh, again, another uh, conflict. On the post-referendum arrangements, uh, President sp spoke about them, and um, uh, they are going to start very soon. And I think the progress in those agreements is going to have an impact on whether the referendum sort of goes smoothly when both sides know what to expect at the end, um, um, uh, or 
they could um, uh, the, we could have bumps more than um, one would expect otherwise. As the UN, besides working very closely with the um, in partnership with uh, the AU panel, we are very lucky uh, to have really this um, this panel um, um, of um, uh, very distinguished uh, leaders. We accept their leadership. We are working actually under their leadership with full partnership from um, uh, the uh, UN. And I, I believe so far there is uh, sort of a, a, a readiness <coughs> from both sides um, to reach at something very beneficial, mutually benefiting to the two. In all our discussions, uh, I know, for example, the NCP um, is also gearing up to um, uh, have a campaign for unity. It's not just the NCP. A lot of northern parties um, included uh, are gearing up to do that. In our small way, we've been trying to, yes, uh, making unity attractive is not something that should be dropped. But what is going to make unity attractive? Um, it is good to recognize a lot of, um, uh, lot of time uh, had been um, um, uh, really not fully utilized during uh, the last six years. Perhaps the international community also bears a, a, a part of that responsibility in that the whole focus was shifted to Darfur, 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 and um, um, uh, concentration on them. In other words, you know, the proper attention was not given to that. But the best way to make unity attractive, I believe, is to make um, a separation possible. In other words, no blockage, no obstacles, and um, um, do not then take separation to mean a complete divorce work uh, with, um, number one, work with um, 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 the two parties to continue to work, to see what is in their mutual benefit, um, the linkages that are going to be necessary for them to resolve common problems. And second is to concentrate on uh, what happens in the North as well. That the um, opening that has been created in the political space, in the democratic space, widening that to arrive through consultations, wider consultations with all stakeholders at a kind of a structure of governance that is going to be not only inclusive, but I mean, would allow the equitable participation of all Sudanese regions and peoples um, um, in their governance. I think this is being recognized by many. And um, uh, with that positive attitude, that continuing, I can see, as the President uh, Becky said, that it is a hopeful situation, that this could go uh, peacefully, with bumps perhaps, but that we would see through without a break down into, into war. We as the UN are um, uh, planning, of course, number one uh, is preparations for the, UF, for the um, referenda. We uh, have been asked and we do understand that we have to redouble the level of our engagement, of our um, uh, support. Um, much more from that of uh, the elections. It is absolutely important that um, the process of the referendum um, avoids uh, some of the discrepancies that were, um, uh, um, uh, in other words, um, uh, seen during the elections. And both parties understand and accept that. They've asked for greater participation, greater support, technical and logistical support. They've asked for greater participation closely with the Referendum Commission to make sure uh, 
that measures are taken to ensure that the credibility of, um, um, of the uh, uh, referendum, um, including perhaps monitoring. Monitoring is an important aspect of the CPA. It's there, internationally monitored. And um, uh, to our, um, uh, I'm, I'm very happy really, that both sides asked for a greater, much more than the technical support, uh, engagement of the UN to make sure that, uh, that um, the referendum process is credible. I think this credibility is important for um, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, 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 legitimacy of the outcome. <clears throat> and not only acceptance by each side, but international support um, uh, to that uh, outcome. And uh, we have appealed really to um, the UN, the Security Council for example, who just came from there, that the UN, uh, should this request come not separately from either side, but both come with a request for that, that it should be positively responded to. Um, of course, within the limitations that uh, the UN uh, can do, uh, there's no way the UN is going to be able to ensure security, for example, in an area where there's, a, the, there's an army, there's a, a police, and um, uh, the, the groups actually within there. And we can support the security process, um, but definitely, uh, even if we bring 100,000 troops, which will take two years to collect the way we've, we've seen uh, setting up other, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, peacekeeping uh, 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 operations. Uh, but we will, we are ready with uh, the capacity we have to uh, support um, ensuring security, um, training the police, mentoring the police, and um, the army, also the UN peacekeeping forces, to be deployed in areas that would help <coughs> the, um, in other words, ensuring uh, security. And we are going to deploy as far as the county uh, level in order to be um, able to support um, uh, the effort. Um, of uh, uh, the commission of, um, well, basically the institutions of the government of Southern Sudan that are supposed to provide the security um, uh, for, for the process. Well, let me, let me stop there. It's a tall order, actually, what has to be done. And we have pre made preparations. These are um, provisional preparations on the expectation that uh, the commission, um, um, once uh, formed and comes up with an operational plan, is going to identify what it is that is needed, what it is that the governments could provide, and then identifying the shortfall that they would require the international community, including the UN, to, uh, to uh, provide. So we are uh, waiting for the formation of the Commission uh, um, to, to finalize, but we already have made plans because implementation could take a long time. Preparations on the ground have uh, already um, uh, started. Uh, well, with this cautious but optimistic <clears throat> approach, I think, um, 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 I think we are, uh, we, it is possible really to resolve this, um, uh, this issue which is important not only for the whole population uh, of Sudan, but the region and the whole African um, uh, continent indeed. Uh, let me stop here. Thank you. I want to thank our two presenters. I find it reassuring that uh, people of such, statesmen of such stature and experience are so centrally involved in this process, both our two presenters but also the two other members from the AU Commission, President Boyoya and uh, General Abu Bakar. 
it's hard to be optimistic about the situation in Sudan, but I've heard the speaker's optimism and I'm reassured by their competence and the degree, the level of their involvement that uh, things will unfold in a way that we all can be hopeful about. Before I open it up to general questions, let me pose one of my own. Given the reluctance of African states and other states around the world to redraw borders, what is your anticipation about the disposition of, particularly of African states and the African Union generally toward recognition if the referendum ends in a vote for uh, secession and independence for the South? Even that's yeah. just one. Yeah. You would speak for me. Okay. Um, well, the, 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 the particular point, of course, about the, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, which provides for uh, uh, the, the, the right of the people of Southern Sudan to, uh, to the right of self-determination to the people of Southern Sudan, the particular point about it is that the African Union is, is in fact, one of the guarantors of the agreement, mm -hmm. of the CPA. So from the beginning, the, 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 the African Union is committed to the implementation of the CPA, an element of which is this one. Mm -hmm. uh, so even the mandate that we got as a panel from the African Union when they constituted us was indeed, please work with the people of Sudan to make sure that they implement the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, including this element. So there is, in that sense, uh, uh, a, a position that's been taken already. Mm -hmm. It is true, uh, it's perfectly true that uh, uh, historically the uh, African continent has been very wary of the re redrawing of these colonially uh, uh, inherited borders inherited from the colonial period because of the fear of the fragmentation of the continent, and that's a real fear. Mm -hmm. You, you could you could uh, have a fragmentation of the continent which would create uh, enormous problems. Uh, <clears throat> and, and that is why, uh, uh, indeed, I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain that both the SPLM and the NCP are themselves sensitive to this. That you see, even if the population votes, the, 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 let me say, the signatories, that's the NCP and the SPLM, you'd remember, uh, for instance, in the Machagos, uh, Machagos Protocol, they said they prefer unity and indeed would want to work together to encourage unity, to make unity attractive and so on, because that was their own understanding of this. Mm -hmm. But then you've got to deal with the actual real political situation that the population may then take its own decision as is provided for in the... So, so I'm saying that I would imagine that in the, in the discussion of the post-referendum negotiation I mean, matters between the, the NCP and the SPLM, <clears throat> they would themselves be mindful of this, uh, that uh, a separation, for instance, if the population votes for separation, this then does not translate into the North and the South becoming enemies. Uh, separation, sure, fine, done. But then how do you construct a relationship uh, such that you, you do not communicate, you don't com not only do you not complicate the lives of the Sudanese people, but you don't communicate the rest of the, a, a message to the rest of the continent that such separation equals hostility uh, between neighbors and, and, and therefore to that extent countries pulling further apart. But uh, as I was saying uh, at the beginning, the fro so from the beginning, the, given the fact that the African Union is in that sense one of the guarantors of the CPA. Mm -hmm. It becomes one of the guarantors of ensuring to ensure that the referendums take place as planned and the outcome is respected. So that, that would be the attitude yeah. of the continent. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I will open it up for questions and comments. There is a microphone that will be brought to you. Identify themselves. <clears throat> identify themselves. Yes, identify yourself and your institutional affiliation. Yes. Omar Ismail, uh, the NF Project. Thank you, sir, for um, or sirs, for this presentation. Uh, President Becky, last year in uh, September, October, with a, a delegation from uh, different Darfurian actors, we met in Addis Ababa uh, before your report became public. And we talked about the uh, 
the uh, aspect of the accountability. What we understood from that discussion with you and your uh, honorable uh, um, uh, colleagues in, the, in that meeting is that the hybrid course that you advocated in Darfur are for uh, the uh, number of people that might not be uh, uh, handled by an international panel. Uh, I, I haven't heard that here today. And what about the uh, outstanding arrest warrant on uh, President Bashir and others? Are they going to be tried locally as part of this hybrid uh, um, court? Uh, are you advocating that? Or they will be handled differently uh, with the ICC uh, arrest warrant that is going to be there. Uh, that is one. And the second thing is the uh, peace process that is going on in Doha now is having a lot of problems. And uh, a lot of people consider uh, the process as it is standing today uh, not to be uh, uh, able to produce any outcome that is going to um, uh, end the, the, the crisis in Darfur. And you are already setting a ceiling for uh, this uh, time cap. On the, on, the, on the process. What are the suggestions that you have that might push this process further and make it uh, possible to reach an agreement within the time frame that you are talking about? Thank you, sir. The, uh, <clears throat> the, the way that we've approached this, you would, uh, you would have seen this in the, in the report uh, that the panel prepared on Darfur. Uh, the approach we're taking with regard to the negotiations in reality is that you've got to look at the Darfur negotiations. There are two related elements to them. There's one leg of that which, which relates to military questions. Uh, you need a peace agreement among the belligerents to stop the shooting, to stop the war, which is what is essentially what is happening in Doha which brings the government and then the armed groups, essentially to agree on a ceasefire, security matters, and so on. <clears throat> a, a peace process, therefore, in that context. But to solve the problem of Darfur, you need more than a, a peace agreement that stops the shooting. You need an agreement about a whole range of other matters. Uh, uh, power sharing and wealth sharing and, and you know all of that. Now, <clears throat> so you need also a global political agreement. Now that is why we're saying that in order to get to that global political agreement, you need the inclusive process. You need the inclusive process, which must then discuss everything. You'd recall that uh, uh, the uh, negotiations in Abuja, which produced the Darfur Peace Agreement, they were preceded by the adoption of the Declaration of Principles, which then guided the negotiations. In fact, that Declaration of Principles, in our view, uh, if, if you add to the Declaration of Principles, that Declaration of Principles, the issue of justice and reconciliation, that in fact would provide, that's the agenda. <coughs> for the inclusive negotiations, which go beyond merely stopping the shooting. So uh, we, we would want the Doha process to continue, to uh, uh, arrive at a, a formal ceasefire which everybody who is involved uh, concludes. It's important. <clears throat> but it would be incorrect to say the population of Darfur cannot get together to discuss the totality of this thing which would produce a global political agreement. It would be incorrect to say that population cannot get together to discuss those until you've had a ceasefire agreement. So you've got to proceed with this inclusive process to find this. Which inclusive process must include the armed groups? The same armed groups that are talking in Doha or not talking in Doha, they need to be part of that inclusive process. And we've discussed the matter with the government to say, therefore, it's going to mean <clears throat> that uh, the, uh, the, the, the leaders of these armed groups who are outside of the country or in the bush would need to be granted necessary immunities and indemnities so that they can participate and get the protection from UNAMID and so on so they become they participate in that process. So they are not contradictory, these two things. 
and, and we're pretty certain that if you send, uh, the population of Darfur is coming together in a Darfur Darfur conference to negotiate the global political agreement, and that means the armed groups have to be represented there, that they will in fact come. <clears throat> because it's not possible for them, it's irrationally anyway. It would not be possible, it makes sense for them, the armed groups, to stay away from a process which is representative of the totality of the population of Darfur. They would come to that. Even if they, they have problems in terms of participating in the, in the Doha process. So in that sense, the, that inclusive political process would in fact encourage a further movement with regard to the processes in Doha. And part of the challenge has been the, this methodological approach, the methodology. There is a war in Darfur <clears throat> which requires to be concluded through negotiations. Now, uh, therefore, what we need to do, step one, stop the war. Uh, how do you stop the war? Bring everybody together, the belligerents, to conclude a ceasefire. And once uh, that con the ceasefire is concluded, that opens the door to the global political negotiations. That's the methodology that's been pursued. The problem with it is that you then give power of veto to the belligerents. <coughs> if I say, look, I'm sorry, I'm not coming to those negotiations next week, it means no ceasefire can be concluded. And if you make the rest of the process dependent on that ceasefire, then nothing will move. So we are saying that you can actually move. It's, it comes from the population of Darfur population itself, they've been saying that, when are you convening this inclusive conference? Because we can negotiate this thing and end and it. So, so that's what will happen. But there's a relationship between two. But we're convinced that once you got that inclusive process going, it would, in fact, encourage the belligerents <clears throat> a meeting in Doha to conclude the peace agreement, which is indeed an, an important component part of the global political agreement. Now, with regard to the, this, the justice matter, we, we've had uh, uh, some meetings with the, with the uh, uh, prosecutor of the ICC, uh, uh, Mr. Ocampo. And what he has said to us is, uh, first of all, you've got to understand, we have got to understand that the ICC is a court of last resort. Uh, and does not displace the national judicial systems. And therefore, uh, it was important, he said, that we must address the matter of what do we do about the justice thing? Because the justice thing cannot be addressed exclusively by the ICC. And as I say, he says, bear in mind that the ICC is a court of last resort. So it's necessary that you address this matter. So it was addressed in the way that you have indicated, the hybrid court and, 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 and so on. Now, <clears throat> so he then says to us, so with regard to the warrants that have already been issued by the ICC, take that as given. That's happened. And uh, uh, anybody who wants to, any change uh, with regard to that, uh, they would have to go to the judges. And the approach of judges, uh, normally whoever would have uh, the, 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 the local standby uh, to approach the judges to impact on that. So take that as given. Those warrants have been issued, uh, and the ICC will do whatever it, it, it has to do with regard to pursuing those. I'm not talking now about this uh, possible uh, uh, decision that might be taken by the Security Council with regard to this referral business. But that's what he says. So now, please, so you must address, he says to us, you must address this justice issue. Outside of the ICC, the ICC will proceed with, with what it is doing and the warrants that it has issued. So, okay. So, uh, I'm, so I'm saying, that's why I'm saying that we then, uh, really, actually, this suggestion came from within, among the Sudanese, who said in order to address this particular issue of lack of confidence by the Darfurians, in the independence of the judiciary and the investigation and in prosecution systems and so on, you've got to bring in other people. Hence this hybrid thing. 
Now, so uh, you'll have uh, your investigators who will investigate crime. What crimes have been committed in Darfur? Who committed them? Who should be prosecuted? And so on. And I, I don't know if you can ring fence it and say that, but when uh, Tabum Begi's name pops up, leave that alone. I'm not sure that you can. I mean, the investigators will say this Tabum Begi has committed these following offenses. Uh, must be charged. And indeed, the, uh, uh, the Sudanese themselves, from President Bashir downwards, say to us, uh, as would be reflected in our report, yes, indeed, crimes were committed in Darfur. Everybody accepts this. They must, these crimes must be investigated and prosecuted, and nobody is above the law. So this, this, must, this must happen. Now, quite what the, the investigators and prosecutors would do, practically, I don't know. Uh, but the, uh, as I say, the uh, 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 <coughs> prosecutor Ocampo said, uh, we will proceed with uh, the ICC decisions. But you must focus on the matter of this justice outside of the context of the ICC, because the ICC cannot deal with all of these things. Uh, so that, that's how the matter is, 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 that's how it sits. I want to recognize the, the ambassador from Sudan and the Pagan Amum from the SPLM to uh, make brief statements. Pagan, why don't you go first? Uh, thank you very much. I have one question and one comment to make. Uh, the question that I have is that uh, uh, we have been a party to the process, but I'm speaking here from a point of observation, which is neutral. That my name is Pagana Mumukej, uh, SPLM Secretary General. Uh, we have observed a clearly politically motivated intention to delay the process of the of the referendum, starting with the failure to to negotiate the law until we almost had a crisis, failure to implement the permanent code of arbitration resolution on ABA, a failure to demarcate the south north border and delaying it up to now, failure to establish the referendum commission up to now, and as you know, that the referendum commission is to start registration on the 9th of uh, July. It is only 23 days to that activity, only 23 days, and the commission are not established. What can the African Union and the United Nations do to save the peace process and to avoid the return to war, as it has mentioned in the beginning, particularly to bring encouragement or pressure to bear on the parties or any of the parties that is obstructing the process. We are in a very critical moment. I don't want to dampen the, the optimism, but this is a reality that we have. We have left with 23 days. I think we are in a crisis. How can we avoid this? My comment is that the two parties have agreed, supported with the international community and the region and the African Union, to make unity attractive. And we have agreed to establish a long interim period of six years. But the, the observation also of uh, many, many observers and including the conclusion by the two parties and other political parties in the country is that there has been no success to agree on a program of making unity attractive to be implemented. The two parties, all the Sudanese, have failed to make unity attractive in five and a half years of the interim period. Is it really possible to achieve something in six months, especially that even this is still only a statement, no program yet implemented up to now. Now, this creates the question of uh, 
is the Sudan as a country, as a state, inclusive enough to make Southern Sudanese feel that they can belong to it? And with the fact that our government, the government of Sudan, at the national level, literally has no single program that provides services or solves the problem in Southern Sudan. It has no any uh, meaningful percentage even of participation in civil service by Southern Sudanese. And these are serious challenges. What can the UN, AU do in tackling the issues of restructuring of the Sudanese state itself? We know the panel had developed in its report and identified the question that the problem in Sudan is basically a problem of failure of, of the Sudanese to build uh, a nation building program, a consensual nation building program. What is going to happen to that approach and aspects? And we are approaching the deadline of the referendum. Thank you. Why don't we hear from the ambassador first before you give a response? Thank you, Mr. Smoke. Uh, thank you, uh, Udrow Wilson Center and USIP for organizing the event. And I thank the distinguished presenters and the African Union high level implementation uh, partners. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, for the <coughs> elaborate briefing about the situation in the Sudan. The people of Sudan are determined to achieve stability, which is necessary for development. Uh, and so, whatever would be the outcome of the referendum, which is, the, which is the last part of the implementation of the CPA. The North and South, which are bound by history and geography for long, are determined to work together through cooperation for their mutual political and economic benefit and for the stability of uh, Africa. With that, we are also determined to find a solution to the conflict in Darfur because there can be no stability in one part of the country uh, or in the whole country if one part is at war. Uh, so I thank you for the insights you have brought to the international community here and your continued encouragement for our search for a peaceful resolution of the conflict. Thank you. Want to make comments? <laughs> the, uh, 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 the matters that uh, are, are raised by the uh, Secretary General of, of, of the SPLM. Um, let me say we, uh, I'm quite sure that uh, nobody would contest the fact that there, there have been delays, delays with regard to the implementation of all sorts of things. Indeed, Haile Menkerios here mentioned uh, delays that took place even in terms of holding these elections that, that were held now in April. That, that, that is, there's no, 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 no dispute about that. But the challenge really is how do we move forward? This is a big challenge. Now, I don't know where, uh, uh, Pagan, whether we should get into a long discussion about this. Take, for instance, the matter of the, uh, the formation of the two referendum commissions, South Sudan and, and Abia. <clears throat> you know we've been engaging both the SPLM and the NCP about this matter to say it is very important, critical, that this matter must be sorted out quickly because we are late. Uh, so uh, the last time uh, uh, we were in Khartoum and uh, raised this matter, 
discussed it particularly with uh, the Vice President uh, uh, Ali Osman Taha. Uh, he said to us, uh, within the next, either tomorrow or day after, the names will be submitted to Parliament, as the law requires. We said, very good. We flew down to Juma, uh, <clears throat> and as we were set there to uh, start our meeting with uh, uh, the President Salva Kiir, a uh, person who was in the meeting, uh, I won't mention his name, you know him, he said, I'd like to inform you, panel, that in fact the names have been submitted. We said, very well done, because we had been pressurizing on this thing. <clears throat> so uh, then, then I left, I went back to South Africa to watch football. <laughs> uh, uh, quite confident that this one is solved. Then when we're here in the United States, I hear that uh, this thing has not been approved. So I was checking, I was checking last night as to, but now what is the delay? And I do not know whether this is true or not, but what I've seen in the press is that there's an objection to a, a person who is a member of the DUP. Uh, that this is what's held up the approval of the South Sudan Referendum Commission. Because there's an objection to the uh, presence of this member of the DUP in the commission. It's a matter that I thought had been resolved, <clears throat> because it did when we were in Juba, when we were told that, in fact, this name has, uh, the names have been submitted. President Salwaki said, has the matter of this particular person been sorted out? And the answer was yes. So I was very surprised to see it now, just yesterday. Now, I'm, I'm saying I don't know if we're this, we, can, we, are, we can discuss this kind of detail because you say, what, what can you do to make sure this process moves forward? We'll take the, the commission on ABA. And again, we've been insisting that this matter has to be sorted out. Uh, <clears throat> we can't make nominations for the, the... And so the position of the chair of the commission is a position that's outstanding. But we can't make nominations about that. So, but we sort of must bang tables and say this thing must, must happen. So uh, it's the story you'd get, they'll say, uh, uh, people in Khartoum will say, look, uh, we're waiting for the SPLM to make uh, further nominations about this. Uh, and uh, we'll look at that and, 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 and see whether we can agree. So we go to Juba, we say, well, now what about this? They, they say they're waiting. Look, we've made so many nominations. And they, each time we make a nomination, they don't accept. Uh, so it's stuck. <clears throat> so indeed, we continue, we'll continue to fly between Khartoum and Juba until this person is found, uh, which is what we can do. No, I'm, I don't think we can get into that kind of discussion here. And indeed, with regard to all of these issues uh, uh, that are outstanding, uh, the... We ask, the presidency is supposed to meet to discuss and resolve these outstanding matters with regard to the delimitation of the north-south border. Because the chair and the deputy chair of that committee dealing with this matter, they tell, we meet them, we say, but what is happening? Well, we have finished the delimitation process, except that there are certain areas along that border on which we have not agreed. And according to the agreed procedures, we must then refer these matters to the presidency so that the presidency can uh, sort them out. All right, so we say, okay, then why are you not doing that? Well, we are still preparing our report. When are you going to get the report ready? So uh, when we met them, the chair and the deputy chair, they said to us, look, we undertake, we make sure that this report is with the presidency by the beginning of June. So we, we go back to the president and say, this, this report is coming, <clears throat> so you people must sit and discuss this thing. I think it's only, I don't know when. So we keep banging the doors with the presidency to say, but you are delaying a decision with the finalization of the north-south border. They say, but the, the joint commission has not reported to us. We don't know what it is that, that they, have not dis they are disagreeing about. So we can't address this. So we go back to the committee, say, committee, what is happening? So anyway, I'm, I'm told that now uh, finally they've submitted the report. And indeed we're told, because we're insisting on this, but we need some specific information. When are you going to discuss it? 
So the discussion was, the decision was, no, it's then on the agenda of the next meeting of the presidency. So fine, all right. When we go back, we're going to check <clears throat> whether indeed they've kept to that. Uh, so, but these are sort of interventions, you know them very well. Uh, but that they, they have to be, they have to be done. But I think that uh, certainly one of uh, our plea, which we've communicated to both parties, uh, has been that, uh, you know, there is a shared, a shared responsibility uh, between these two parties to make sure that all these problems are solved. Uh, the, as, as Haile was saying, as you know, the new government, the new national government has been constituted. Uh, members of the NCP and the SPLM, they in this, in this government, majority of the ministers and so on. And so there you sit in a very powerful institution together. Uh, <clears throat> and I think together I should say, uh, what is it that we do to resolve this, these problems? And most certainly, I, I mean, we will continue to, and I know uh, the highly does the same thing, we will continue to bang at the doors of, of both of you to say, but you are in partnership. And that partnership is expressed very physically in the fact of this government, minister of this minister, or minister this NCP, minister that SPLM, minister. Uh, what is this national institution doing with regard to this, and we'll continue banging tables about that. But certainly, uh, uh, <clears throat> I think that we, uh, and recognizing the fact that there was, there was a lot of delay uh, with regard to a number of things, indeed, as you addressed, we now must then deal with this reality. 23 days, registration must start, and so on. Well, what do we do? We were last time, that last point, uh, last time we, we were in, uh, in Khartoum, we said we want to meet at least the chair of the South Sudan Referendum Commission. Just to get a sense from, from him, has he been thinking about the program of this commission? It's very late. Uh, he, he knows he's been accepted by everybody. Sure, the matter has not yet gone to Parliament, but when he sits at home, or he must do some homework to say, on Monday I will do this, on Tuesday I will do this, and so on, I will consult and so on. We just wanted to check that. Uh, because it, in order to give a bit of a push, uh, <clears throat> we've discussed, for instance, with the National Election Commission and said to them, look, uh, you, the, 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 these uh, uh, referendum commissions are going to be established. Can, can we take the cars that you were given for the elections? Take the cars take the office equipment, take the computers, so on, and give them to these other people. Because you can't start from, when you say start from scratch, you must start looking for an office, for a car. It's going to take you another three months before they are up and running. So I will make those sorts of interventions, but hopefully with the support of the SPLM and the NCP. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, not to, um, to uh, say long to repeat, but about that we are constantly, every day, actually talking, well, you know, to you, uh, to your side, and to the other side also. Um, the thing is, you don't find a blockage. You know, you don't hear, for example, no, we're not going to do this, or um, elements, actually, that, that indicate to you there really is no will one way or the other. I mean, it's always, you know, I don't want to get into details, but always, for example, well, we are ready to discuss the formation of this zero, but the government of southern Sudan is too busy trying to form the government. They haven't, you know, come up with it. And then you call, is this true? Um, uh, this constant sort of um, uh, trying to push the two parties actually to expedite it is your responsibility. It, it is in your hands, and we will do everything possible to put the encouragement, the pressure necessary when one side clearly is, is, is sort of in any way delaying. On one thing, I think I, I feel we've, um, uh, there is a commitment actually to. Why would, if the NCP was not absolutely not committed at all to accept the possible separation of southern Sudan. Why, why on earth would it be discussing on post 
referendum arrangements, that is citizenship, that is definition of borders, and that is, in other words, you know, you don't talk about citizenship, you know, if you're not ready to entertain the possibility of two separate citizenships are there. And, and, and therefore, you can only encourage, okay, you know, let's go on with the process. Uh, look about this referendum now. I mean, uh, I said I was happily surprised when not only just South Sudan, I can understand why the SPLM would ask, for example, we want the UN to run this um, whole thing, we want the UN to monitor it because we want uh, that this be um, uh, not only a transparent process, but be accepted at the end, so that we have guarantees, you know, uh, later on. But when the NCP itself also, I, I got this paper actually from the president directly, I mean, two days before I came, we want that these elections, I mean this uh, referendum, be credible. We don't want interference. We've seen interference before, um, I mean, during the elections. Elections, you know, come and go. I mean, this time, okay, discrepancy, next time you correct. This, the finality of this, of, this, of this decision, you can't repeat it again. We want it to be credible. We have concerns that uh, there may be interference from the other side. And therefore, we want the UN to monitor this whole problem, I mean, uh, process, including have, um, um, uh, take care of security, in other words, you know, of people to freely vote. Well, I mean, somebody who is ready to tamper and, and, and make it impossible doesn't invite, actually, others to monitor. And therefore, if one saw a clear sort of diversion from the CPA, from the stipulation of the CPA, then it's easy to, you know, one can say, okay, there's got to be greater pressure, there's got to be a different position taken. But I think with this commitment, you know, um, we will continue to work uh, with, um, uh, with the parties um, uh, um, about making unity attractive. I did mention at the beginning, okay, yes, making unity attractive, and whether that unity has been made attractive or not, it is the exclusive right of the people of southern Sudan to determine, to decide. And therefore, the, um, um, the outcome of a free exercise of the people of southern Sudan has to, be, uh, has to be accepted. They, and only they, are the ones who would determine whether unity has been made attractive. Many of us may have our ideas. And that is why we are advising that the best way to make unity attractive is since perhaps not much has been done, you know, in the past, from our observation also, that it shouldn't be just either from here up to the referendum or finito after that we can't continue if it becomes separation. That separation should not be taken as a total end of the process of trying to make unity attractive, that the process must continue in a longer term process where I mean, the entire East Africa, the whole African continent really is going on an agenda towards integration. You know? So on the basis of equality, on the basis of mutual interest, the question of making unity attractive not only between South Sudan and North Sudan, but the whole region um, uh, should, um, should, should continue. And this is a positive thing, I think, um, that the more you sort of repeat this, the more people would not just try to cram within a very short time what hasn't been done over a long time. Um, uh, so, yes, but making unity attractive should not be, uh, we are not seeing it in a very short, um, in a very short um, uh, process. In fairness to those in the overflow rooms, let me read two questions from people in the other room. How have the negotiations surrounding the Nile progressed, and what impact will these negotiations have on the referendum and post-referendum process? And the other question is, what role do you see for NGOs in the North-South scenario? Mm. I mean, you want to... 
<laughs> well, I mean, uh, on the on the Nile issue, uh, in, on the Nile issue, no, I mean, uh, uh, well, none of us, none of us have been involved in the in the negotiations with regard to the Nile Nile River Basin. Um, I I think I'd find it difficult to hazard a guess as to what the impact of those negotiations would be. It's a rather complicated complicated process. But neither, neither us, neither the UN nor ourselves have, have really dealt with the Nile River. No, no, not the UN, but I am from the Yeah, you, you are, you are. You, you are Nile I, River, I, yes. No, I you know. are Nile River, that is true. Uh, but uh, institutionally, <laughs> no. Uh, um, yeah. Go on. yeah, I mean, uh, the, the Nile River issue, I don't think it is just a south-north issue alone. It's an issue that concerns the entire region. Mm. And um, there isn't a particular, in other words, you know, impact on whether the north and the south sort of um, um, uh, remain together or don't remain together. I think it is an issue where um, all the... There has been a time, a policy of confrontation concerning the Nile, uh, Nile um, uh, the sharing the Nile waters. That attitude has to change into a policy of cooperation between those countries and whether Sudan remains one or um, becomes, in other words, you know, two separate states, the issue remains the same. I think all the countries of the region have to work towards a cooperative approach towards the sharing of the waters of the Nile rather than trying to stick to, um, 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 in other words, you know, what is perceived by many, by the majority, as an unfair, in other words, you know, um, uh, arrangement that was done years and years ago and um, that that can be just maintained like that. Um, forever. I think um, it would have to be seen within that context and I don't see it really becoming uh, that much of an issue, okay. although some observers do uh, think so, including some countries may, uh, may think so. The role of NGOs, I think NGOs have a tremendous role. One of the key um, um, uh, um, uh, priorities there is, is that um, there has to be a massive support to capacity building in southern Sudan, whether it uh, chooses to be separate or chooses to be part of Sudan, the fact that this has been marginalized, this has been sort of an area that has been neglected because of war, because of uh, 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 whatever so far, um, that it is necessary that the capacity, the institutional capacity um, um, in southern Sudan um, um, is, is increased so that afterwards um, there could be a soft landing um, to whatever, um, uh, to post um, um, a referendum. Uh, this effort is, um, is a preoccupation of the government of southern Sudan. It is also um, a, an occupation which we consistently hear from the government of, um, in the north also, from the NCP also, that this must be supported. Um, and uh, the NGOs um, have a big role in working with the government of southern Sudan to support capacity building in different areas. We at the UN, for example, coordinate. We've been asked by the Security Council, in fact, to coordinate. The country team is working with the government of southern Sudan to do this. But it's um, um, uh, NGOs and other donors actually that have the funds um, and they are very, uh, working very closely um, uh, together. The, the, the fact is up to now I think the SPLM sometimes you know um, uh, the reality is that there's a feeling well mission not yet accomplished and therefore we may have to fight tomorrow and there is sort of an emphasis on, on maintaining um, that capacity and um, I believe um, uh, contrary to those who might feel, you know, after, uh, if it becomes a separate, it's going to be a failed state, it's going to, uh, you know, I don't, I believe once the question of the referendum and the decision of the people of southern Sudan is ascertained, then the concentration 
uh, would shift towards um, development and then the role of these NGOs. The problem is um, uh, that if there isn't a concerted, uh, in other words, you know, leadership, local leadership, ownership by the government of southern Sudan, then uh, the efforts, uh, when there is so much goodwill, the efforts could, in other words, you know, um, uh, unless coordinated, not work. And I can only see that coordination being done by the government of southern Sudan itself. It's a challenge, actually, for you. Yes. Two, two more, David. Two more. Okay. We'll have two more. Two more questions, and then we'll have to close. Okay. Uh, I'm Dr. Jen Kane Edwards. And I'm a member of Sisterhood for Peace, a global network of diverse Sudanese women who are collaborating to promote peace, justice, and reconciliation throughout Sudan. I want to thank the center for organizing this, and I want to thank the panelists for briefing us about the situation in Sudan. My question is uh, related to the issue of inclusiveness, and in particular, the inclusion of women in the peace process in Sudan. And I, uh, this question is related to the report that you wrote, uh, the African Union High Level Panel or Darfur report 2009. And in that report, you call for 30 percent representation of women in peace negotiations in Sudan. So what are some of the mechanisms put in place to ensure women's representation in negotiation process? And this is uh, given the fact that the parties to the peace negotiations, whether the NCP or the uh, liberation movements in Darfur, uh, sometimes they tend to either ignore or marginalize women's role and participation in the peace process. So I want you to really give us a specific uh, or some specific mechanisms to ensure women's inclusion, women who can speak women's issues are related to the Sudan situation. Thank you. Hey, of course, this is, uh, you are quite correct. I mean, we, uh, uh, <coughs> during the time we were preparing that report on Darfur, uh, we, we had a very extensive uh, interaction with, with women and women's organizations uh, uh, in Darfur, and indeed they themselves raised this point about the importance of the inclusion of women in these processes, uh, hence indeed this proposal that we made that therefore when you convene this Darfur, Darfur conference, at least 30 percent of the delegates should be women. Now, wh what is going to happen is that uh, we, we are going to start immediately to, uh, to deal with the matter of the representation in this conference. Uh, this is an issue that was raised uh, uh, last time we, we discussed it in, in Sudan. All right, now that we're going to convene this uh, uh, Darfur, Darfur conference, for instance, how, how is the delegation of civil society going to be composed? Uh, because you've got a whole plethora there of uh, civil service organizations, uh, and they will have to get together to find, uh, to determine what uh, delegation, how to constitute their delegation. So we met, for instance, civil society, and then said, all right, now can we begin the processes uh, of constituting this delegation? So what it means, we then have to interact uh, 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 with them, with civil society as it com composes, as it constitutes its own delegation. The delegation can't be constituted by us. They must constitute it themselves. But um, the intervention, our intervention would be had to help to ensure that uh, it, it, this, it meets this kind of quota. And now that would relate to uh, other sectors. The difficult one is going to be the... Uh, uh, the native administration, what is called the native administration in Darfur. Uh, these are the traditional leaders. And indeed, one of the hottest discussions we had uh, when we were preparing the report was on this matter. Uh, we had a meeting with, this, uh, uh, with, the, with the, the, these traditional leaders. It's an open meeting, uh, women there. Uh, and we're raising this question. You, you are called the native administration. You want to be party to uh, this uh, process of uh, 
a negotiated resolution of the conflict in Darfur, and we, we agree because they play their own role, the traditional leaders in the society. So, but this matter then arose. Uh, how are you then going to deal with this issue of the representation of women? So that became a very, very hot debate with this chief saying that, no, 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 we cannot be led by women and so on. So it was, it was a big fight. <clears throat> so, I mean, those sorts of issues will arise. But in the, in the manner in which, as we work with these various constituencies to call, constitute the delegations that will go into this, surely this is one of the matters that, that we will address, uh, this one. And, and indeed, I, I, I should say, I don't know the, uh, I haven't seen the, uh, the, the composition of the government, uh, the national government, the new one. One woman. <laughs> every, every woman knew that. <laughs> and that is social affairs. No, because, uh, no, I was raising it because um, the last time that uh, I met President Bashir, he, he said to me that uh, now the, this requirement of 25% representation of women in parliament has been met. And uh, that day he had a meeting with women and he said, the women I've just met are saying to me, the same thing must be done in the way the government is composed. So it's only one. Yes. Just one. Take the last question, the man in the hat in the back row. My name is Hodari Abdul Ali from the Give Peace a Chance Coalition. And President Becky, I want to first commend you for your career of championing championing justice and self-determination for Africa and by extension all of humanity and taking everything into account including the fact that there have been a lot of forces working very hard for a very long time to break up Sudan into two or three countries from the standpoint of the African Union how preferable would it be for the Sudanese to be able to find a way to resolve their problems and stay united. And Mr. Menkarios, if the UN in fact does oversee the process of the referendum, will parties from the North, NCP or others, be allowed to campaign for unity in the South without interference from the government of South Sudan? I'll answer that. I'll I'll answer that. Answer that. Um, <laughs> Um, um, on this on this unity question, let me let me just repeat to all of you what um, President Bashir himself told told me when we were talking about this um, question of when I was asking his commitment to the CPA, which says um, um, that the people of Southern Sudan will be freely deciding whether unity has been made attractive to them. Now, I don't want to go back into the history of what created this whole war itself. But President Bashir told me, I am fully committed. I would prefer that the people of southern Sudan you know, um, choose uh, unity, but I will accept whatever they decide because we, as a part, we have tried war. War didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't get us anywhere. And therefore, we have um, 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 chosen peace, I mean, possible separation with peace rather than unity with definite war. So now you want, in the interest of just unity, where there isn't equality, where there isn't will actually from a people, you try to impose that unity for them, you are imposing war on them. We all wish the people of southern Sudan would choose actually um, unity. That unity has been made attractive uh, to them, but it is their decision and nobody else can be more Catholic than the Pope if the Sudanese themselves, North and South, have accepted that that is the only basis for peace, then 
um, I think the only thing we can wish for them is that they do not take the end of this exercise as an end of the process of trying to make willful unity attractive. And that's what we are trying to do. On the possibility of... Um, uh, um, that's what the parties are trying to do. And we are supporting them. We are there actually to support their decision. Uh, number two is the, the question of will they be able to campaign? Yes. It is not us actually, it is the parties themselves who have agreed whether the UN is observing or not observing that the um, uh, northern, um, the NCP and other northerners are free to campaign um, for unity within southern Sudan. Thank you all. Yes, because the, uh, you see the, uh, the, the, the referendum uh, is to decide, is to give the, give the possibility to the people of South Sudan to, to decide whether they want to remain in a united Sudan or in two separate states. Uh, and therefore, uh, undoubtedly, uh, those who favor unity must go and talk to the Sudanese people in South Sudan and convince them, please vote for unity. Those who want separation must go and campaign and say we need, and that's, that's what will happen. It, it should be normal uh, in terms of uh, once a choice, yes or no, uh, that people would campaign for, for either. You see, and the point that uh, Haile Mankarios is making on the unity question is very, is very important. You see, the, uh, the starting point with regard to this uh, indeed has to be uh, respect uh, for the views of the people of Sudan. Uh, the decision, the decision to, uh, 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 that the people of Southern Sudan should have uh, exercised the right to self-determination is a Sudanese decision. Came from the Sudanese themselves and uh, uh, I might have thought that the Sudanese were wrong. I might very well have thought that that was the case, but never mind what I think. Uh, here are Sudanese who are d determining the destiny, their own destiny, destiny of their country. So we've got to respect that. And that's the position they've taken. But most certainly, as, as we were saying before, and that Haile was making this point, <clears throat> that uh, uh, we are all Africans together. Uh, and this continent is trying very, very hard. We, there's a, as you know, a very hard push. Uh, for African unity. And some people who are certainly have been ahead of me <laughs> uh, who have been even saying, why are we not forming a government of the United States of Africa now? Uh, and they've been, these ones have been quite a way ahead of me, but anyway. <clears throat> but it's an indication of the sentiment. There's a very strong sentiment around the continent. It's quite clear that uh, we, we, as, we, as uh, President Buyoya raises this thing all the time, uh, here is Burundi, Burundi uh, uh, very much uh, getting into the East African community because as Burundi, it's a little Burundi there and so on, it can survive. It's got to integrate into the rest and, and so on and that's going to mean free movement of people, common passport and so on. And, and I mean, I'm saying the sentiment is it's shared right around, right, right, right around the continent. And so indeed, as we all respect the, the decision of the Sudanese people, which will result in the referendum in January. So surely we say, but uh, <clears throat> what's, different, what's the difference between me and Paganamum? None, because this Paganamum must be able to come to South Africa freely in the same way I must be able to go there. What's, what's the problem? Is even this border between South Africa and Southern Sudan must cease to exist. So we would indeed, imp the impulse will be, whatever decision is taken in the referendum in January, the impulse will be towards the integration of the African continent. And therefore, this unity matter, as Haile Mengerios was saying, we can't treat it as though it's a six-month project. It's a longer-term project, and indeed, uh, in the end, uh, South Sudan and North Sudan and South Africa and Burundi and Nigeria and uh, even Eritrea. <laughs> yes. We've got to be part of this of this one thing. 
<laughs> and I think if we contextualize the decision that will be taken by the people, if it's for separation, we contextualize it in that bigger thing. It's, uh, it's something that the continent can manage. Thanks. Thank you. And I'll... Turn the mic back to Steve McDonald for the, to dismiss us. Okay, thank you very much. Before giving a warm uh, thank you to our, our participants, uh, I, I want to uh, please ask your forbearance and to stay in your seats while the uh, main party, the presidents and, and their, their uh, staff and, and associates uh, move out of the hallway uh, so that we can give them a head start on the elevators, okay? I thank you for you doing that. And thank you very much to our, our marvelous and, uh, and uh, very fair-minded uh, moderator, David. You've done a wonderful job. And our warm, warm thanks to President Becky and um, Ambassador Mankirios. Thank you very much. Thank you.